Hello everyone! Today we'll be discussing the people group known as the Britons. No, not these Britons, or these Britons, but these Britons. More specifically, we'll be discussing their languages and my proposal for a mostly unified writing system for them. But first, let's do some history to try to understand what we have to work with. The Brythonic languages are a group of closely related languages spoken on the British Isles and northwestern France, consisting of the modern varieties of Breton, Cornish, and Welsh. They are part of the larger Celtic family, together with their Gaelic cousins in Ireland and Scotland, who in turn are all part of the greater Indo-European family, making them distantly related to the likes of English, Russian, Persian, and Hindi. The Celtic family itself was once much larger, spanning across all of Europe with dozens of languages being spoken in several different regions. Since then, however, it has seen a severe decline, both in area and number of speakers, and now is only found clinging to life in the fringes of northwestern Europe. The reason for this decline are complex and multifaceted, spanning several millennia and many different people groups. But in the case of Brythonic specifically, we can look for an answer in the Britain's immediate neighbors to the east. The English. By the end of the 4th century AD, the mighty Roman Empire was in shambles, with provinces breaking off left, right, and center. One of these provinces was Britannia, a region similar in area to modern England, which would break off from the empire around the year 410. The natives of this region were the Britons, and their language was common Brythonic, the ancestor to modern Breton, Cornish, and Welsh, and a few others. As the Romans collapsed, however, the Forman province broke into pieces, with local petty kings and lords constantly fighting each other for regional supremacy. This left the region politically fragmented and extremely susceptible to Germanic raids from the east. One such Germanic tribe was the Anglo-Saxons, a composite group from northern Germany. They spoke a Germanic dialect, often called English, which would eventually become the basis for modern English. These Anglo-Saxons began to raid the coast of Britain around this time, burning and pillaging as they went, but eventually finding the local Britons disorganized and the land relatively fertile, they decided to stay. An interesting thing to note here is that the famed legends of Arthur, king of the Britons, is supposed to have taken place around this period. However, as time went on, more and more of these Saxons began arriving, ultimately assimilating and pushing the local Britons out to the fringes of the region. Some Brythonic groups were so distraught with the Saxons that they decided to leave Britain entirely, settling in the northwestern coast of France, making them the ancestors of the to the modern Bretons. This explains why the modern region is called Brittany, meaning in fact Little Britain, as opposed to Great Britain, being the modern UK. Another interesting side note is that in all modern Celtic languages, both Brythonic and Gaelic, the English language and its people are still called Saxons, or some derivation thereof. Further into the Middle Ages, then into more recent times, the Celtic languages on the Isles began declining in favor of English and its dialects, and in Brittany, French. The first one to go was Brythonic Pictish, going extinct in the 1100s, then soon followed by its southern neighbor Cumbric in the 1200s. By the 1700s, Cornish had gone extinct, and by the late 1900s, Gaelic Manx had also died out. All other Celtic languages, with the notable exception of Welsh, had also suffered severe, near-terminal declines by modern times, where in many of these areas, use of these languages were banned. This brings us to modern times and the purpose of this video. With many of these languages in various stages of being revived thanks to preservation efforts, it is important for them to build off of a strong and most importantly historical foundation. And that begins with a stable orthography. And out of all of the Brythonic languages, the only one with such a stable foundation is Welsh. Though, as anyone who has ever even so much as glanced as anything written in Welsh will most certainly comment on its peculiarity. Which begs the question, how can we build a solid base for all of these languages to thrive while also preserving their ancient past and rich traditional culture? 
Let us then set a few guidelines for us to build a working, historically accurate, and culturally respectful orthography. The guidelines shall be thus. Number one, spelling must honor their modern pronunciation, but also be general enough for any dialect to be able to use without extensive modification. If something works in one dialect of a language but does not work in another of the same language, it's out. Number two, spellings must honor traditional Celtic letter usages. This means that using letters or combinations of letters that don't have any ancient historical basis or are based on other language groups like English or French are also out. Examples for this are the modern Breton C apostrophe H, ZH, GN, etc., Welsh's double D and double F, which are all relatively recent inventions, especially in the case of Breton, inconsistent use of the letter K across the board, as I've seen many times suggested, the likes of assigning the letter X to the sound H. And finally, number three, spellings must also honor the historical spellings pronunciations of its common Brythonic ancestor, which unites all modern Brythonic languages together, giving us a solid base to start from. With that brief introduction out of the way, I now proudly announce the new unified Brythonic orthography, available with minor tweaks for Breton, Cornish, and Welsh. It contains the full 26 letter set of the Latin script, with almost no diacritics of any kind, and a handful of assorted letter combinations. Let's begin with the alphabet's individual letters, then letter combinations, and finally special rules for each language. Afterwards, we'll go over some examples with the new system. A Alach B Bes C Kair D Diliad E Erch F Forth G. Glen. Ha. Hallen. E. Isel. J. Giraffe. K. Kantav. L. Lawen. M. Mab. N. Not with. O. Organ. Te. Pedwar. Que. Question. Er. Rath. S. Sach. Te. Te. U. Ufern. V. Vaccine. We. Whiskey. Xe. Xenon. Ye. Yar. Ze. Zo. That's it. That's the alphabet. You probably noticed, however, that some letters have slightly varying pronunciations or special rules. We'll be going over that in this section now. So first we'll start with the digraphs, that being combinations of two or more letters. For plain nasals and labial consonants, which can't use a single letter, they will simply use the nearest combination of single letters. One exception to this rule is the phoneme qua, which usually comes from Latin or English, and not usually French, it shall use qw instead. With that exception out of the way, here are the common digraphs. NG will be ng, NGW ngwa, GW is gwa, QW is qua. For fricatives and devoiced phonemes which don't get a single letter, they will follow a similar pattern where we will take the base phoneme and just add H to it. Here are the digraphs we'll be using for this section. CH is H, DH is THE, it varies in pronunciation in Breton to Z or H even. PH is F, though this will only be used 
for initial mutations and words from Greek or Latin origin. TH is TH, also varying in Breton to Z and H. And WH is HWA, from Proto-Celtic SW in initial position or also in initial mutations. Everywhere else, the sound HWA is spelt C. H W. And we also have a few special ones only used in Welsh. LH is the th sound, the old double L in Welsh. MH is H, and GH is H, and GWH is H, and H is H, and RH is H. Now for digraphs involving the yod and yod affection, yod being another name for the sound y. When we have a sequence of a consonant plus y, we will do the following. When we have a consonant, yod, and a vowel, in Breton and Cornish, we will use the letter y for the yod. So for example, rya will be spelled r y a sha which is technically xia it varies in pronunciation will be spelt s y a breton also has some finally palatalized consonants um, these will be spelt the vowel y and then the final consonant so for example the sound al will be spelled A-Y-L, and Agn will be spelled A-Y-N. Welsh is slightly different. Welsh, instead of the Y, it will use the letter I instead. So like above, the sound Rya will be spelled R-I-A, and Sha will be spelled S-I-A. Welsh needs to be different here, as the letter Y is treated slightly differently when not initial, which will be explained later. So now for double consonants. Double consonants are not usually pronounced differently than their single counterparts, unlike the old Welsh double L, but they may be used to show orthographically different words with similar pronunciations. An exception to this rule is the Cornish double M and double N, which can be pronounced abm and adn. It cannot and must not be written as bm and dn, respectively. You may compare Icelandic and Faroese double L, tla, and double N, tna, which come from an older long L and long N, just like Cornish. So we will keep them as double M and double N to show, to show the origin of these words and also to respect other dialects of Cornish which not may pronounce these letters in these ways. A reverse exception to this is the Welsh th, the old double L and now spelled LH which does not usually come from the Berthonic long L, like in Cornish, but instead is a separate development from the plain single L, hence it is spelt differently. In fact, the sound was commonly spelt as LH in Welsh until the printing press circa 1500s, where old texts still have LH for th. And now for some more specifics to Welsh, Though Breton and Cornish use a variety of double consonants, Welsh only really uses double N and double R. Even then, modern Welsh has deleted many of these that used to be present in common Brythonic, causing words to be either spelt the same or with an added circumflex on the vowel, creating ambiguity. These will be restored and the circumflex removed, as it's no longer needed. So an example can be the word can, meaning bleached, it will gain an N, and the word kan, meaning song, will lose the circumflex. Another example is the word glin, meaning valley, it will gain an N. Similarly, gwyn, meaning white or fair, will gain an N as well. A fun fact about these double Ns is that they can also be found in Gaelic. 
such as in the Irish word fin, related to the Brythonic word gwyn, from Proto-Celtic windos, the double N being a change from the ND becoming an N. For foreign words that originally had a double consonant in that language, may keep it. This serves two reasons. One, it shows the original etymology and spelling of the word in the original language, but it also shows that the pronunciation may not be as expected were it a native word. An example of this is the Welsh farwell, which has an irregular stress on the last syllable because it's from English, farewell. In this case, the spelling will be changed and the accent will be removed since the double L in Welsh is now no longer expected in native words. And now for some vowels. Vowels are usually straightforward, but a few digraphs and extra rules are used when vowel length is unclear, for extra phonemes not represented by single letters, or for etymological reasons. So first we'll look at the Brythonic Y. In common Brythonic, it differentiated between long and short i versus long and short e. This was usually written with a y and an i respectively. Greek loaned words were then borrowed with the y sound in mind. Modern Brythonic languages have altered the sound, however, depending on the language. In Breton, this y becomes e pretty much everywhere. In Cornish, it varies by dialect. Some merge it with the letter i, others with the letter e. Welsh is the only one that kept it distinct, but the pronunciation varies depending on word possession. It remains i in final syllables, but a uh everywhere else. An example for this is the word asbati. The Y spelling shall then be kept in Cornish and Welsh, but not Breton, except in loans. Additionally, in Breton and Cornish, but not Welsh, final unstressed I is also spelled with a Y. Now for extra vowel phonemes. So there are two vowel phonemes represented by digraphs. U and U shall be represented by OU. This is the previous Welsh letter W as a vowel. The next phoneme is e and its long counterpart. Welsh doesn't have this phoneme, but the digraph eu will still be used for ae. It will be explained later. And now for diphthongs. Diphthongs being two vowel sounds next to each other. Unless otherwise noted, vowel plus a w or vowel plus y will equal those exact things. So for an example, aw is ow and ay is i. An exception to this is Breton, usually finally. ow, usually finally, though not always, is sometimes pronounced as oo. This is done to match Cornish and also the various dialects of Breton, which pronounce it slightly differently. Uh, everywhere else, OW in Breton may also be pronounced as a long O. Another exception is Welsh, as stated previously, which uses the Y slightly differently. For the vowel plus a yod, it will use an I instead of a Y. So AI will be I and EI will be A, etc. Welsh diphthongs, previously spelt with a vowel plus a u, will be spelt instead as a vowel plus a y. This is done to free up the letter u to be used in the digraph ou as u and eu as ae, in a manner similar to Breton and Cornish. Due to this usage, the letter y can't be used as y near a vowel except initially, as it would be confusing. Diphthongs involving any vowel plus i and any vowel plus e remain unchanged. So the old au becomes spelt ay, 
OU as O becomes OY, etc. AE remains unchanged and AI remains unchanged, etc. A reverse exception to this rule is the WY pronounced UI, which will now be spelt using UY. This is done to be able to differentiate between UI and WI, as before it was either completely ambiguous, since both could be written WY, or written with a cumbersome circumflex over the W. The circumflex is then always removed in this case. You may then ask yourself, why not use O-U-Y? And the reason is to keep it consistent with diphthongs having two letters. And as U-Y being pronounced as U is both not used and technically not pronounceable in Welsh. Thus, no confusion arises. Now for vowel length. Vowel length is generally not marked as it's generally predictable in stressed syllables though a few digraphs may be used for disambiguation in certain cir situations. These are the common digraphs used for all languages. Their pronunciations vary, but the idea remains the same. AH for long A. Ah. This will only be used in the vocative particle, such as in OH MY. AE and AI or AY may be used for a long A eh sound. Welsh, however, will pronounce A-E as A. E-A will be a long E. O-A will be a long O. O-E will be a long O. Except in Welsh, where it is O-E. Because of this, the circumflex is now completely abolished, as it no longer has any use. A slight exception to these digraphs is the Welsh a, ah, meaning and or with, which will be respelt as ha to match Cornish and Breton. So nasalization in Breton. Nasalization in Breton occurs usually from an m after a vowel that has been lost but still affects the vowel as if it still existed. Thus, the vowel is nasalized, but no neighboring nasal constant is actually found afterwards. It was commonly denoted by N with a tilde, like the Spanish Ñ, but now the following rule will be followed. Before another consonant, finally, or by itself, it will be written with an M, as opposed to AN, which is usually pronounced AN with a clear N at the end. Anywhere else, it will be spelled M-H. So, for example, the A nasal and then V will be spelled A-M-H. Similarly, if it has an A, an O, and then nasalized, it will be spelled the same way. This follows the example of Gaelic, which is functionally and etymologically similar, though phonetically it's slightly different. And now for some final rules. In final obstruent devoicing is when you have a stop consonant that is voiced at the end of a word, etymologically speaking, but actually pronounced is devoiced. So nouns and adjective pairs may be distinguished by alternating voiceless and voiced final consonants. So in this case, B and P, K or C and G, and T and D with nouns being the voiced and adjectives being the voiceless. So the word Brethonek, meaning the Breton language as a noun, it will have a G at the end to show that it's a noun. And Brethonek as an adjective, meaning a Breton person, thing, object, etc., will be spelt with a C to show that it's an adjective, even though they're technically pronounced the same. So you can compare, for example, the word Litheranic Brethonic, meaning the Brethonic alphabet. You can see that the first word has a voiced G at the end, because it's the noun, it means alphabet, and then Brethonic at the end is spelt with a C, because it's the adjective, meaning Brethonic. 
even though they're both pronounced with a k sound at the end. Lastly, vowel hiatus. So this is when there's two vowels near each other, but they don't form a diphthong. Instead, that they're two separate syllables. They shall be using the diereses. Finally, with all of that out of the way, we can finally look at some examples. Our first example is Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So here we can see it in Breton. Here I made two examples for the new versions of Breton. One of them is probably the recommended one, without the Brethonic Y, as previously stated, since no Breton dialect usually pronounces it, while the second one does have it mostly for educational purposes. You may pause the screen now to take a closer look. Next is Cornish. So this is actually the one that changed the least, but you can still see there's a few slight changes here and there. I've done something similar to the Breton here, where I've shown examples with and without the Brythonic Y, though some Cornish dialects pronounce it differently, so it's probably recommended to keep the Y spelling. Again, you may pause the video to read at your own leisure. Last but not least, we have Welsh. Welsh, you can see, ended up with the biggest visual change, shall we say? You can again pause the screen to read more closely. Here we have also a comparison of all of the old versions of this text, and you can see that Breton, Cornish, and Welsh, although related, they originally have fairly different orthographies, and it obfuscates their relatedness, shall we say, which is one of the main reasons for me creating this video in the first place. And here we can see how they all look together now with the new versions. And you can see they're much more closely related, at least visually on the page, than you would otherwise think. Also, here's a bonus. There exists a reconstructed version of the Brythonic Cumbric language, which I've also applied my orthography to, which you can see here on screen now. You can take a look here and see what's changed. Now for our next examples, we'll be using the classic Old Land of My Father's hymn, which there are versions in all three languages. Firstly, here's the Breton one. Here's the Cornish one. And now, finally, the Welsh one. And that's it! I know it was a lot of stuff, but I hope you liked and enjoyed the video. Leave a comment down below if you have any thoughts on this. And hey, if you know any people that speak one of these languages, consider sharing it with them. I'd like to hear their opinion on it as well. And as always, thanks for watching.